Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 38 years we have engaged the community in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Our hour-long forums are free and open to all, and we invite you to join us in the sanctuary of Westminster Presbyterian Church for upcoming events. Information can be found at westminsterforum.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful, snowy downtown Minneapolis. And I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Art Cullen is editor and co-owner of the Storm Lake Times, a flourishing family-owned twice-weekly newspaper founded in 1990 in Northwest Iowa. In 2017, Mr. Cullen was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing for a series of columns indicting corporate agribusiness for their role in polluting the rivers and lakes in the most intensively farmed land in the world. His recently published book, Storm Lake, chronicles his 40-year career in journalism and describes how the people and prairies of Iowa have survived and been reshaped by changes in politics, agriculture, climate change, and immigration. A graduate of the University of St. Thomas, he has been a reporter and editor with newspapers in Algona, Ames, Mason City, and Storm Lake, Iowa. His commentaries have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and the Star Tribune. His brother John is the publisher of the Storm Lake Times. His son Tom is a reporter there, and his wife Dolores is a feature writer and photographer. It's a family business. When he accepted his brother's invitation to join the Storm Lake Times, he opened a new chapter in his life, adopting the motto, print the truth, raise hell. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Art Cullen. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, for what they charge around well, for, for parking around here, it makes me want to become a Presbyterian. <laughs> um, well, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out on this snowy day. It's uh, really something when you can get a room full of Minnesotans to listen to an Iowan. <laughs> it's also something that... Uh, when two kids from a tiny little high school called St. Mary's High School in Storm Lake, Iowa, uh, Northwest Iowa, we had a graduating class of 44. It's really something when both of us get a book published in the same year. And uh, uh, the Minnesota Historical Society uh, just this last summer published a book by my old friend Marty Case, one of my best buds from high school. It's called The Relentless Business of Treaties. And uh, Marty, I think, is in the audience. There he is. There's Marty. Uh, stand up, Marty. Please. It's a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award. And I think it's just really interesting uh, that both of us had book published in the same year. Marty exposes how some of the most famous names in the upper Midwest history, like Ramsey and Dubuque and Sibley, acted as signatures to treaties that expropriated this land from the nations of indigenous people who inhabited it. And it was really the predicate for their ethnic cleansing and genocide, which I argue we're, we're still maintaining today by locking people up at the border. My book, Storm Lake, picks up where Marty's left off with treaties. The last native people had been run off and locked on, into reservations in South Dakota. The first white surveyors found the lake pure and pristine in 1854. Once we had cleared out the area, the ensuing Swedes, Germans, and Irish settlers broke the prairie, drained the bogs, and ripped out all the cobblestones from the lake bank to build this uh, tall corn paradise where we raised hogs. Uh, 
back when Marty and I were in school, it was about 7,000 people, Storm Lake was. Today, it's about twice that size. We're not sure how many people live in Storm Lake because so many of them are undocumented. It's a meatpacking town, and we figure about half the town may be Latino now. But it's 15,000 people now. When I was in, when Marty and I were in school there, there was one African American in Storm Lake, and he was a student at Buena Vista University, a small liberal arts college, Presbyterian, by the way. Uh, and his name was Furman Rents from White Plains, New York, and he was my hero. And you'd see him walking around town with like three or four little boys walking behind him, shagging basketballs for him. Uh, he was my hero, 6'3", smooth, could go to the rim. <laughs> the place was prosperous through ups and downs. It became more so after World War II with the introduction of chemicals and the elimination of the horse. Farm sizes grew as productivity and income rose, and farmers began to compete for more land so they could chase higher yields and greater revenues. A commodity price bubble sent crop prices soaring in the late 1970s, and nobody thought that that $12 bean market in Amsterdam would ever fall. Land prices set records. But in the 1980s, the bubble burst. The farm debt crisis buried the family farm. It consolidated agricultural suppliers, farms, and rural communities. And it drained the population of farm boys away who worked nights in the packing house raising hogs by day. Also in 1990, my brother John was working in public relations at Buena Vista University after a career in newspapers. And he missed his editorial soapbox after, like I say, 17 years in community journalism. So he tried to buy the incumbent newspaper, the Storm Lake Pilot Tribune, and he walked into the office one day and he met the 22-year-old publisher who was the son of the chain owner from uh, another city in Iowa. And John asked if he could buy the paper. He really missed the newspaper business. And this kid told him he didn't really understand community journalism after he'd worked nearly 20 years at community newspapers. And uh, he got so mad, he got his Irish up, we're 100% Irish, and he walked out the door and decided he was starting his own newspaper that day, a weekly. And he had two little kids, one and two years old, we call them Irish twins, and, uh, uh, and his wife and I told him he was nuts. I was working at the Mason City Globe Gazette at the time, which was at uh, 27,000 circulation morning newspaper. I was the night editor, and the title's as glamorous as it suggests. I hated it. <laughs> as we Catholics say, it was my vision of purgatory. <laughs> but when he, when he started the I, but he convinced me to come. Two months after he started the paper, I was there. And uh, we knew there were two huge stories. First, our lake was sedimenting in. What God made 26 feet deep, actually the, the Des Moines lobe of the Wisconsin glacier, made 26 feet deep. In just about 150 years, we had her down to about seven foot of average depth. And we knew that the Raccoon River uh, was polluted with nitrate and phosphorus and that Iowa's surface waters are the most polluted in America, believe it or not, and southern Minnesota too. And in fact, the conditions in southern Minnesota are worse than they are in Iowa. The community began a campaign to lobby the state to dredge the lake. Uh, and the Storm Lake Times led the cheerleading. Uh, it was successful. Over 20 years, we just stopped last year, and $20 million spent, we dredged 7 million cubic yards of black gold from the bottom of that lake. The water this year, for the first time in my life, I'm 63, is clear. It used to be a brown, turbid, stinking mess. Thank you. So anyway, it caused us to look into the other prairie pothole lakes between Storm Lake and the Minnesota border that were also formed by the glacier 14,000 years ago. And all these lakes, including Storm Lake, were just fine for 14,000 years until those white surveyors showed up. So we also knew that climate change was increasing 
was, was increasing soil erosion starting at about 1980 in exponentially higher rates. And these lakes were disappearing rapidly. Our pressman, Jim Robinson, and I set out to photograph all of them per, for posterity just to show people that these were lakes once. The state's been converting them to marshes to filter the agricultural runoff from fields. Uh, and so we, we tried to find people who would talk to us about it from Iowa State University from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, local agronomists and farmers, and nobody would talk to us. Interviews were canceled, people were hanging up the phone on us because they knew what we were up to. Uh, and so I didn't know what to do with these pictures, and I had no story really, so I took them down to a meeting of the Iowa Environmental Council, it's a nonprofit group in Des Moines, for their annual convention to show them these pictures and just to prove that these were lakes once. And I was sitting uh, on a panel next to the CEO of the Des Moines Water Works, which provides drinking water to 500,000 customers in uh, the central Iowa. And he had looked at these photos, and he turned to me, and he said, we're going to sue you. And I said, what? What for? And he said, over agriculture. You are polluting the Raccoon River to such a point that we've had to build the largest nitrate removal system in the world to make our drinking water safe, and it's all coming from these underground drainage tiles that are uh, spewing nitrate into the Raccoon River, and they also draw drinking water from the Des Moines River, uh, which is further east. And uh, he said they're gonna sue us over it. And uh, so I ran back, actually drove back to Storm Lake, and wrote this huge stud horse bold headline, they're gonna sue us over agriculture. And nobody paid any attention to it. He's a, he's a, a long haired guy, they thought he was just a hippie who didn't quite get it. That, uh, you know, this is the way we've been doing things in Storm Lake. So, uh, we knew that this lawsuit uh, was going to be terribly expensive and they were suing Buena Vista, Sac, and Calhoun counties and their drainage districts, which are a strange creation of Iowa law, and the counties are trustees for these drainage districts. So we sent uh, my son Tom down to the courthouse to ask the county board of supervisors, and my, I think in Minnesota they call them county commissioners, to ask the board of supervisors, how are you going to pay for this defense? Will it go, go against property taxes, assessments to the drainage districts, what? And they said, it's none of your business, we got friends. Whoa, well, who are your friends? They said, can't you hear? It's none of your business. They wouldn't tell us a thing. We were able to find out that the Agribusiness Association of Iowa, under the direction of Governor Terry Branstead's former chief of staff, longtime advisor, kingmaker and judge vetter, Doug Gross, a Des Moines attorney, had recruited Monsanto and guess who? The Koch brothers to lead the formation of a secret defense fund with a bottomless pit. We wanted to know who the other donors were. We found this out through our own reporting, not through their records, and they wouldn't tell us. So we engaged with the Iowa Freedom of Information Council, a nonprofit of, comprised of journalists, broadcasters, uh, artists, uh, anybody interested in free expression and open government to engage on our behalf, and they started writing very nasty, lawyerly letters to the Board of Supervisors to say that these donor lists are public records. We also engaged in a two-year editorial campaign urging transparency and a mediation between agricultural and environmental interests that could advance both. And that is possible. We can have a stronger, sustainable agriculture that's more profitable than the chemical model is now, where we're losing a buck a bushel on everything we grow thanks to Donald Trump and his idiotic trade wars. We can have clean water. We did before land use changed so dramatically in 1980. And we argued that we must change as islands. Our soil is so degraded, now catch this, our soil is so degraded that corn yields could drop by 50% or more amid climate change in the next 40 years. And that's according to a wealth of scientific research, including from the University of Minnesota, the Goddard Space Institute at NASA, and Iowa State University. 
We're already seeing declines in protein content in corn and soybeans from Iowa fields today. Uh, corn is getting starchier and less protein, and it's fueling an, an epidemic of diabetes in Latino populations that, that use a lot of corn in their diet. Where 14 inches of topsoil once lay, there's none today on many knobs in this flat Des Moines lobe, the richest corn growing world, uh, region in the world. If we're going to feed a growing world amid more extreme weather, we need to break ourselves free from the chemical jones and plowing up every inch of Iowa ground, right up and into lakes. I have pictures on my cell phone of soybeans being planted into a state-owned lake, Pickerel Lake, near Marathon. And farmers are planting right into the Raccoon River. We convinced the county to withdraw from that secret slush fund because it was violating the Iowa Public Records Law after $1.5 million had already been sunk in defending the suit. About six weeks after the county pulled out of that illegal fund, a federal judge ruled that drainage districts had no standing to be sued. Their only legal authority was to clear drainage obs obstructions in the interest of public health. So they can blow up beaver dams, but they can't remediate pollution claims. The judge dismissed the lawsuit, and the Koch brothers are free to pollute as they will. Still, we felt our editorials had made a difference, and I knew they were good. It was a David versus Goliath thing, little paper versus big ag, and normally we don't enter contests. The only people who love contests more than journalists are movie stars. But this time, my vanity made us enter the Pulitzer Prizes and I was able to squeeze 50 bucks out of my brother to pay for it. <laughs> and for that reason, I prayed feverishly to St. John Bosco, the patron saint of editors and pressmen, <laughs> hoping for some help. And uh, something told me in my head that I was gonna win this thing. And so, it, I know you can't believe it, but my wife is my barber. And, <laughs> I asked her uh, if she could give me a haircut on Sunday, April 9th. And she said, why? And I said, because I'm going to win a Pulitzer Prize tomorrow. <laughs> and she, okay, sure, I'll give you a haircut. It looked like hell anyway, so. <laughs> and at 2 p.m. on Monday, April 10th, 2017, I had tuned into this live stream on Pulitzer.org to watch the winners. And there's 22 categories, I think, in journalism, drama, and poetry and fiction and nonfiction, and uh, uh, editorial writing is number 18, so they start off, you know, investigative reporting, the New York Times, international reporting, the Washington Post, explanatory reporting, ProPublica, and they get down to number 17, and they say, commentary, Peggy Noonan of the Wall Street Journal, and editorial writing's up next, and I said, they're gonna call my name. <laughs> and sure as hell, they did. <laughs> they said number 18 for editorial writing, Art Cullen of the Storm Lake Times. And I shot up out of my chair and through the stained ceiling tiles in our gray metal building, we call it Storm Lake's nicest machine shed. <laughs> and I screamed, we won, we won! And my brother John, who sits five feet away from me, uh, says, what did we win? He thought we'd run a spool of fishing line or something. <laughs> And I said, we won the Pulitzers, man. And for the first time in our lives, we hugged each other. <laughs> <laughs> We're not huggers. And then I hugged Tom, but I couldn't hug Dolores because she was busy taking photos. <laughs> but we played a part in changing the conversation in Iowa. Finally, we were beginning to realize how farming practices combined with climate change and more extreme weather are slowly killing us and our communities. But the battle rages. While some talk of a Green New Deal, the Farm Bureau is applauding the Trump administration for repealing what little protection exists for surface water. It's called the, they repealed the, surf, uh, what was it called? Uh, surface waters of the US or something like that. I can't remember. Another thing we learned 
was that the agrochemical cabal would spare no expense defending its co corn soy hog paradigm all planted in a chemical base because to deny an acre of corn and Roundup is to deny Monsanto its due. Again, going back to 1990, all that increased agricultural productivity brought by science and technology had to go somewhere. And so we started flooding Mexico with corn and pork. In the process, we were killing the regional ag economies in Jalisco, Chiapas, and Huachaca, the birthplace of maize. With the NAFTA treaty, we we're also moving Iowa manufacturers south of the border. The Maytag repairman's pretty busy now. They had drained out of Newton, a manna, drained out of a manna. And meantime, these guys that were making 30 bucks an hour as union members were watching brown people move into Storm Lake and Denison and Marshalltown, making half that wage. And everything was changing. And Iowa's rural communities were deteriorating. Yet, we have all these Latinos processing our corn even though they were displaced by it. Nefarious interests played on it. They ran national TV ads describing what a horrible place Storm Lake had become. The anti-immigrant sentiment was growing and found its political voice in a hillbilly by the name of Steve King, a Republican from Sac County, who was building that border wall in his head while Trump was still divorcing his first wife with Howard Stern on the radio. Hey, and another thing, enough of the groaning. You guys gave us Michelle Bachman. <laughs> so anyway, did I mention I wrote a book? <laughs> I'd like, I'm, I got a little reading here that I, explain, I think explains Steve King and Michelle Bachman and, and Donald Trump. If you, so you'll have indulged me here for three to five minutes. I'd appreciate it. I'll just do a little reading. The book is called Storm Lake, by the way. <laughs> God bless Steve King, said the hero of the Klan culture, which is essentially as American as Louisiana, David Duke. Duke was reacting to King's assertions. Having a hard time with my light here. Duke was reacting to King's assertion in 2015 that we're diluting our national identity and culture by welcoming immigrants. King said before that occasion that white people in rural places need to have more babies to preserve that culture. He is pro-life. From King's Sac County perspective, it makes sense. Rural schools now carry names like OABCIG, Odable, Arthur, Battle Creek, Ida Grove. Not enough babies. Enrollment at Lorenz Marathon in Buena Vista County is down 40% over the past 15 years, down 24% at Galva Holstein, which is now Ridgeview along with Shaler Crestland. Some of these schools have only enough players to put eight boys on a football field. Those few babies born in these small rural counties grow up, grow beards, and can't wait to get out of Northwest Iowa for the big city where they can get a job to maintain a culture that they shook off their boots. Not a lot of jobs in Kyron, Iowa, where Steve King's from, population 273. Civilization is under siege then in places like Storm Lake where we're having the wrong kinds of babies. They're babies born to people who weren't babies born here themselves. Natal nabobs of cultural deconstruction and dissimulation. They're coming out the windows of the Storm Lake schools, babies everywhere. And they want to stay here, the son of a dad who works his own store during the day and the night shift at Tyson. That's not the culture King has in mind. There are just a couple of blondies in the Storm Lake second grade of 180. Who will carry us forward? King says it's about culture, not race. If you were born here ignorant, you are of our culture. If you grow up hearing Lee Greenwood sing God Bless the USA, then your children will appreciate Lee Greenwood, or so the logic would go. If you move here smart, you should just keep on moving and don't drop a baby while squatting on my land. The land we took from the original civilizers, as it were, the Iowa people, the Sac and Fox, and the Dakota. Steve King is a modern apologist for the tradition of Henry Lott. He was a whiskey trader who murdered 75 Dakota people. 
am I that different from him? I walked into the bar and grill off the courthouse square in Rockwell City, about 40 miles east of Storm Lake on a recent noon day. The main thing the town has going for it is a minimum security prison and a subway on the highway. The small town cafes can't compete with the pizza places and the convenience stores on the, uh, on, on the highway anymore or the subway. I rolled through the bar and grill through the door and got the hairy eyeball from a guy about my age in a crew cut and a t-shirt. He was sitting with three other working men. I wore a white shirt, blazer and wranglers. I looked down at him at the table seated with his, his friends. He thinks people have been looking down at him since junior high school. I smiled, nodded my head and said hi. He did not smile and said nothing. The Iowa Convention is to greet everyone you see, either with a hello or with the famous index finger wave from the steering wheel to every vehicle you meet. Why do people vote for Steve King and Donald Trump? He wants to flip the bird, not the index finger, to the power centers in Washington and New York and Chicago. Actually, so do I. He knows it won't do any good. But people will get the message. We're sick and tired of it. Those people who flew the coop are making out like bandits shuffling paper in Des Moines, and the rest of us are shoveling manure from a hog confinement pit. People who don't speak English in front of him at the supermarket checkout were using food stamps, and that honks him off. Despite his school taxes going down, he thinks they're going up because of immigrants. Or at least they would be lower were it not for the immigrants. Nobody gives him a break. Young black men could be going to college for free, but they riot in the streets. Nobody gave him a full ride. I've heard him or his country cousins say all this in venues just like Rockwell City. The man I'm culturally profiling in the local grill makes just too much to get a subsidy on Obamacare, and his premiums are higher than they used to be. Try to remind him how his life has improved. He might remind you how manufacturing left Iowa for Mexico, and still Mexicans are moving in around him, or at least close enough, and getting food stamps and not paying taxes. That's what people are told, and that's what they repeat. When you see your position erode relative to everyone else, you want to blame those people who are coming in and changing everything. Repeat it often enough and have it affirmed repeatedly on every media channel available to you by your own congressman and you begin to believe your own story. I could attempt to understand him or I could just eat my cheeseburger and smile at the tremendously friendly waitress. It was faster, cheaper and better than a fast food burger place. And I told her so, and she so appreciated it. She was a friend of my peer with whom I locked eyes. They laughed together. Can he be as intolerant as I thought he was when we first met? Digestion made me start to think about how I look at my peer the same way he imagines me or the brown man who lives next door to me and whom Steve King and Donald Trump want to deport. The diner and I suppose we have nothing to say to each other, not even hello. But if we did get over that hump of just looking at each other and thinking we don't like each other, that guy might say he wants to deport my neighbor, a dreamer. But I don't think he really wants to. He sees his destiny slipping away and can't do much about it, just like in school. When the bully lays it on you, you got to look for somebody weaker to lay it on. Well, that Latina can't fight back. He really doesn't want to deport that nice college girl when it comes down to it. But you do need some order at the border. Whatever happened to the rule of law? And King may be out there, but he speaks his mind. He's not afraid of the system or the man. That's freedom in its purest expression. My peer at the table wishes he could speak his own mind, probably to his banker and his boss and his lawyer and the county treasurer where he pays his taxes. But what newspaper editor would ever run his letter to the editor? And if the paper did run it, they'd want to put his name on it. He has enough trouble. King appears to offer him a way out by challenging all the forces of change that bring nothing but more isolation to a man in Rockwell City. I can see it and feel it among my friends. I spring from the same ground and drink from the same well and sing the same fight song, Go Hawks! Yet we tread in and out of political realities. The premature death rate among white men with a high school diploma or less is rising. 
while the same rate among blacks and Latinos is declining. The researchers from the University of Wisconsin say that the self-perception of being stigmatized as rednecks by so-called elites drives them uh, to internalize the stigma and causes their own self-destruction by suicide, by opiate, by meth, by tobacco, and by liver de disease, the data about rural mortality say. For sure the liver disease around Storm Lake and the suicides, and for sure the smoking, even though they won't allow it in the corner bar anymore. 30 years ago, an old boy would have asked, hey, I see you got BB County license plates. Where are you from? Storm Lake. The walleye's hitting. You got a, a inch or half inch of rain last night, so they might not be settled down yet. We don't have those conversations anymore. It's hard to have a prejudice against someone you know. If you could break the ice, they might ask you today, Storm Lake, how you dealing with all those Mexicans? Pretty bad, huh? No, it's really pretty good, I say, when I do get that chance to look eye to eye and not down. They are surprised and they start to think about it. King doesn't need to talk that way and generally my friends agree. If you could just visit, you can change hearts and minds, most anyway, or at least get them to think about the brown guy like I'm trying at least to think about my peer in the bar and grill. It's more difficult all the time to have those conversations when our shields are up, when we're cocooned among friends on Facebook, conditioned by the constant ideological, cultural, and class battle in which Iowa is set. Thanks. But you know, Storm Lake isn't having any of that. We hired more than 150 teacher aides to help new children learn English. The police don't arrest people for just being undocumented. The young men from 1990 who came from Jalisco got married and had families. Their children can now attend a unique charter school in combination with Storm Lake High School, Iowa Central Community College, and Buena Vista University. In five years, they graduate with a high school diploma and a vocational certificate in welding or machining or nursing, or with an associate's degree from Iowa Central that transfers immediately to Buena Vista or any state university. Buena Vista now offers full rides to first-generation college students. Two-thirds of Iowa's counties have, have lo lose population every single year. Storm Lake and other places in Minnesota, Worthington, Marshall, are the exceptions. We're growing because of immigration. These young people, just now graduating from Iowa Central, are taking maintenance jobs at Tyson Fresh Meats, which bought IBP, for 25 bucks an hour, right out of school. They're 20 years old. Our main street is lined with immigrant-owned stores thriving in the shadow of the Walmart that drove out so many mom and pops 30 years ago. And our crime rate is at a 27-year low, despite what, Pres what President Trump and Steve King might think. We didn't vote for Steve King or Donald Trump in Storm Lake, but the towns that haven't figured out that immigration is the answer to their problems voted for them. I predict King will lose his next election. He almost got beat the, in uh, November. He uh, beat a guy by the name of J.D. Shulton, a bachelor, former semi-pro pitcher who was campaigning in a used Winnebago and had no money, and he got within three points of Steve King. He's going to beat him next time. <laughs> Send him 10 bucks. J.D. Shulton. Our main street is alive. There's one more thing that I'd like to close with. I think I was going blue in 2020. <laughs> Iowans are offended by locking children in cages along a border we imposed by treaty and at the barrel of a gun in 1854, the Treaty of Hidalgo, the same year the white man found Storm Lake. 75% of Iowans say repeatedly in polls that they favor a legal pathway to citizenship for the undocumented. They're tired of the chaos. 
They demonstrated that by unseating two incumbent Republicans, one of which was a Donald Trump clone by the name of Rod Bloom from Dubuque, and they sent two Democratic women to Congress. We're also coming to grips, meanwhile, with our landscape. The practical farmers of Iowa used to be thought of as a bunch of freaks. Uh, they'd get 10 or 15 people at one of their field days. Everybody said, you know, they're crazy because they advocate sustainable agriculture. Now they're getting 1,000 people at their field days talking about co planting cover crops and how to do rotational grazing and bring cattle back to the, li to the landscape and stop this pollution problem. We know we can reduce two-thirds of our river pollution with narrow buffer strips. Minnesota knows it too, but it doesn't do anything about it. It has a law in the books, I think, Minnesota does, but it doesn't enforce it because everybody's afraid of agriculture. Planting just 10% of a field to native grass can reduce nitrate outflow by 90%. We can eliminate the problem if we brought back the 10% set aside that Earl Butts got rid of when he urged us to plant fence row to fence row to feed the world. And you know what? There's people still starving in Sudan. We know how to fix this. We're Midwesterners. And we're just starting to get around to it. General Mills is interested in regenerative agriculture, believe it or not. Farmers raising beef on grass are profitable while farmers growing rows of conventional corn and beans have lost money six years in a row. Farmers know it. And our rural community knows that it needs immigrants to survive. We always will, so long as we can grow corn to feed to those hogs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Art Cullen. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today, Art Cullen, journalist, editorial writer, and author of the book, Storm Lake, A Chronicle of Change, Resilience, and Hope from a Heartland Newspaper. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, and our online media sponsor, MinPost. We invite you to join us at Westminster Church for our next forum on Tuesday, March 19 at noon, when David Hogg, a survivor of the Parkland, Florida high school shooting, and an activist for gun policy reform, will explore the topic, putting the USA over the NRA. Visit our website, westminsterforum.org, for further information. And now, Art Cullen, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from the audience. Start with a question, perhaps, on the minds of many of the Minnesotans in this room today. Uh, one of our senators, Amy Klobuchar, stood in a snowstorm uh, just two days ago and announced that she's running for President of the United States. And We hear that she's popular in Iowa. You're an Iowan. What, what can you tell us about uh, Senator Klobuchar's uh, uh, chances in Iowa? Uh, that's a real interesting question. I assume that Amy Klobuchar probably will place in Iowa, but I was wrong about Scott Walker and Tim Pawlenty. So uh, I'm not sure. A lot of uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore's big complaint with the Iowa caucuses were that Iowa, Iowa Democrats are too liberal. What we are is populist. That's why we elect Steve King, Donald Trump, and Barack Obama. Uh, because they're populist, whether liberal or conservative. Amy Klobuchar is an incrementalist. I don't think she necessarily wants to blow up the system like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders might. And so I think she'll probably place and not win. But you just never know. In Iowa, it's all a matter of, it, you, they say there's a ticket out for the top three. And I think she'll probably be in that top three. But I, again, Donald Trump carried Iowa, and I didn't think that was ever possible. Here's a question that's been emailed into us. Uh, our family farm in Dodge County, Minnesota, is surrounded by 11 swine factory farms 
in a three-mile radius and soon a 12th. Yeah. Minnesota residents have no idea how serious things are in rural areas. Can you discuss the concentration of factory farms in Iowa? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole lecture unto itself, really. And I know who the question's from. Hi, Sonia. You're out there somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, uh, the confinement system, I think, is going to fall under its own weight. Uh, we're starting to see flu pandemics now uh, that eliminated five million chickens in Storm Lake laying hens. And we're seeing, kind of, you know, really uh, virulent swine flus. And I believe, it, and I'm not a scientist, but I believe it's the confinement system itself that gives rise to this. And uh, I don't think they're going to be able to continue in this unsustainable system for long. I think regardless of what we do politically or what markets do, nature is going to demand that we change our ways very soon. It's demanding it right now, actually, with uh, what we saw last summer uh, in southern Minnesota where, you know, we were getting rains that flooded out recently planted crops. And, and farmers are figuring it out on their own now, and they're trying to move in the right direction. Um, hog houses, uh, uh, it's difficult for me to see how they will continue because uh, eventually I think these flu pandemics are going to wipe them out, honestly. Can you describe more what the win-win might be that agriculture could be profitable and the environment can be improved? How does it work together? Well, yeah, uh, we can improve the, the whole key and, you know, a lot of these uh, AOC and Markey don't quite understand the role that cattle play. Uh, you can drive across the entire state of Iowa and not see a single cow standing out there. And we can return to what we knew in the, in the 1960s where uh, we need to eliminate about 30% of Iowa's uh, uh, crop rotation. We need to put that back into grass to, to stop the pollution of the Gulf of Mexico. There's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico the size of New Jersey and growing. Uh, and so we're, try so we're chasing 200 bushel corn yields. We're killing the shrimping industry. And they're getting pretty upset about it down in New Orleans. And they're going to sue us pretty soon. Can you comment on the influence of the land stewardship project and beyond pesticides? No, I really can't. Uh, I'm not, I've heard of the land stewardship project. Uh, I'm not terribly familiar with it, um, and I wish I could give you a better answer. I'm sorry. All right. How uh, confident are you that agricultural universities will develop more sustainable farming practices? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't finished the question yet. Okay. <laughs> when Coke and Monsanto fund the schools so extensively now. Right. Exactly. Well, uh, no offense to the University of Minnesota, but Iowa State University was, uh, was America's first land-grant university and probably its leading research university into, uh, in agronomy and crop science. And uh, they just, the Iowa legislature just defunded the Aldo Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture at Iowa State. Again, it's the, it was the first in the country. Uh, the Koch brothers now control the journalism department at Iowa State, they control the markets program, and Monsanto controls the genetics program. So do I think Iowa State University is going to be delving into sustainable agriculture? No, I don't. Uh, but I do think that they will be forced to support the practical farmers of Iowa through the extension service. They'll be forced to support them. And it's the practical farmers of Iowa and other groups, I'm sure there are in Minnesota as well, that are promoting what we call regenerative or sustainable agriculture that involves less use of chemicals, if not getting rid of them entirely. And it, in, in, it involves bringing cattle back to the landscape and creating small processing plants that create jobs for people. There seems to be a divide among rural urban uh, Demography in, in our state, we talk about a, a lot. Uh, is that a false dichotomy, or do you, as a rural person, experience a kind of a divide from your urban cousins? Well, Iowa's kind of a funny state because everybody who lives in Iowa is like one or two generations removed from a farm or a small town. And I suppose most of the people in this audience are as well. Uh, in fact, half the crowd might have their roots in Iowa, I don't know. 
uh, but uh, there is an urban-rural divide, and, and, and what it is, it's an economic divide. Uh, rural areas are poor and getting poorer. In Pocahontas County, it's depopulating so fast that by the year 2050, there will be nobody left to turn off the lights. There will be nobody living in Pocahontas County in 2050 if the current population trends continue. Uh, that's right next door to Buena Vista County, and it used to be a co county of 10,000 people, and now it, it, it's, uh, it's going to disappear. To what extent has the religious right been a factor in Iowa politics and state government and some of the issues you're talking about? <clears throat> it's a huge factor. Uh, the evangelicals basically control uh, the Iowa Republican caucuses, and uh, that's why Michelle Bachman did so well in Iowa it was because of the evangelicals. It's very powerful. Very, and I would say that most people don't understand this, that, that the main reason people vote for Steve King or Michelle Bachman is because of abortion. And uh, that's what drives Republican politics in Iowa. Question about climate change. How much of the decline of Iowa agriculture is due to climate change moving the Corn Belt north into Minnesota, as opposed to pollution or other farming practices? I don't quite understand the second part of that question, but I think that uh, climate change is uh, playing a huge role already. Uh, for example, the Ogallala Aquifer that serves about two-thirds of the nation's cattle from Amarillo to Dodge City, Kansas, will be out of water within 20 years. And again, this isn't me spouting off. This is Kansas State University war issuing the warnings. And so, yes, cattle will move north. And uh, it's predicted that within, you know, 30 to 40 years, you won't be able to grow corn in southern Iowa. You won't even be able to raise it. You can't raise it even with irrigation now in western Kansas because it's too hot at night. And, too, and it's, so... Uh, the problem with Minnesota is that you get north of uh, you get north of, the, of uh, you know Mankato, and the and the land just isn't as good, um, and so it's a real problem. We 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 are we are going to cr run into some uh, real food production crises within the next thirty years if we don't change our ways today. Let's talk about journalism for a little bit. What is the future for a weekly newspaper like the one your family owns and runs? Honestly, I'm not kidding about this. I think we'll be around next month. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I'm not sure. Uh, when, when I worked at the Mason City Globe Gazette, the circulation was 27,000, seven-day morning paper. Now it's under 9,000. The Des Moines Register used to be 500,000 circulation. Now it's under 100. Uh, the, uh, we, we lost a fair amount of money the year we won the Pulitzer Prizes, and the Pulitzer money and a book advance kept us in business. So if you buy this book, you'll help keep me in business. <laughs> but I, I think you can find uh, there's a direct correlation between the decline in newspaper readership, what actually started when I started in the business. It was, it was declining already in 1980. And there's a direct correlation between willful civic ignorance and the decline in newspaper circulation. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And how does your family navigate the, the ups and downs of the journalism business other than, other than selling books? Uh, how do you navigate that? How are you surviving as a small town newspaper? Well, my brother John works for free. He's the publisher. And his wife and my wife are working for probably illegal wages and uh, lower than a Catholic school teacher. And, uh, uh, and I'm out sh uh, doing speeches and schlepping books. And seriously, that's, I don't know how else to, we lost our two big car dealers, our Ford and Chevy dealer, the same year that we won the Pulitzer. That was, you know, uh, 50 grand right, up, right there off the top. And that's how much money we lost that year. You know, advertising revenue, you mean? Yes. Uh -huh. Advertising revenue is imploding, and I don't know how newspapers are going to survive, frankly, unless readers step up to the plate. And you, you can complain about how lousy the Star Tribune is or how lousy the Pioneer Press is, 
But you know what? If you want to know what's going on with the Hennepin County Zoning Board, you better damn well read the Star Tribune or Min Post or something. You got your start in journalism right here at the Star Tribune, didn't you? I did. I was a copy boy. And what was it about that experience that launched you into a journalism career? They told me to get out. So <laughs> <laughs> I tried for years and years to get a job at the Minneapolis Tribune then, now Star Tribune, and the Des Moines Register, both of which were owned by the Coles family. And what I'm talking about is there was a hiring, there's been a hiring freeze on for the last 40 years. I couldn't get a job. And uh, then I won a Pulitzer and I said, hey, hey, I'm here, Star Tribune. And they didn't I finally got my byline in the Star <laughs> Tribune. I wrote a column about it. And for the first time in my life, I got my byline in the Star Tribune. So I can die and go to heaven now. Congratulations on that. That's Thank great. you. <laughs> Uh, given what you've been talking about today, I'm, I'm wondering, and there's a fellow Iowan out here that asked this question in the audience, can you describe what gives you hope for, for America today? Yeah, that you're all here. <laughs> really, I mean it. And when you talk, I was talking to a Storm Lake High School advanced ecology class, and they know more about nitrate than I do. And they're fired up and ready to go. Uh, I, I'm really hopeful, and, and also, I mean, I was just uh, at the hotel across the street, they're having a rangeland management conference where all these people from western states were discussing, uh, you know, how to make a living in agriculture through cattle. And it's happening. And it's just starting now in Iowa and Minnesota. But we're going to solve the problem. We're going to have to. And, because, and farmers are getting on board now. The ones who are farming 5,000 acres, uh, you know, they're opposed to it. Uh, even though they're losing money. Uh, but eventually, uh, they're going to figure it out, too. And those, those field days are growing. It, we're going to fix it. And uh, we're going to bounce Trump out of the White House. Thank you, Art Cullen. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>